uh, so I'm Isabel. I'm here with a very fine panel here to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about Internet of Things and experiences uh, developing Internet of Things. So uh, I'll, I'll start with, uh, introduce each of, uh, each of them. And I'll start with Prakash. Prakash is uh, one of our, um, I would say, we're like, is that your, are you our first customers? One of the first customers we ever had. So Prakash heads the, uh, uh, is the VP of Software Architecture and Strategy at Trimble uh, Navigation. We'll hear more about Trimble, what they do in, uh, during this panel. And mainly focusing on mobility, middleware, and platform and IoT. Um, you have several patents uh, the, and more in, on the way, um, as well as uh, an award that you received, a uh, Switzerland award for uh, an innovative company created in, uh, in 1999. So uh, welcome, Prakash. Um, and we have our friend Gabriela here, who comes from Romania, right? And uh, has been working for 15 years in the utilities market, so a market which is very... Uh, uh, much uh, linked to the Internet of Things, as well as uh, our very own John Mathan, who you probably all know, who is the co-founder of Tipco. Is uh, I call him our pub sub guru. Any question you want to know, publish, subscribe, and EDA architectures is, is the man to talk to. And as you will hear during that uh, panel, I think he's very passionate about IoT, very passionate about IoT architecture and in particular about Tesla. You will hear about that. If you want to know anything about a Tesla car, he's also the man to talk to. All right, so we'll, we'll get uh, started. Uh, basically, the first question, so we were discussing um, together what, what the best questions were for this panel. And the first one that came up is, so IoT, is this hype or is reality? You know, what is the, what is the story? You want to start with that, Prakash? Yeah, sure. Um Again, first of all, thank you for inviting me into this here. Um, so I was, since I was sitting there and listening to Paul, I kind of felt, you know, it's so appropriate that we're having the discussion here uh, because um, the guy who actually came up with the term IoT happens to be um, from, from England. Uh, the huh? British guy, uh, Kevin Ashton, most of you probably um, who have gone any, done any research on IoT would know that. Um, and also, um, so Kevin was... At MIT, you started with the RFID, um, auto ID project, and, and one of the first companies, he came up with this term IoT, and the company joined was a company called Think Magic. And um, we, uh, at Trumbull, we ended up acquiring Think Magic just a couple of years ago. So, uh, so for me, it's a, it's a much closer connection to uh, IoT. Um, and, and you asked a specific question about uh, whether it's hype. Um, so let me give a little background about Trumbull. Um, Trumbull has been uh, in the business for about 35 years. How many of you have heard about Trumbull before coming here? That's a lot more than I got uh, in San Francisco when I asked this question. Um, because um, not many people have heard. We've, uh, we've been uh, as a company around for about 35 years. Uh, started in the Silicon Valley, founded by Charlie Trumbull. And, and from the very beginning, the company was founded um, with uh, positioning technology, various positioning technology from GPS to inertial to laser. Um, and it was all about um, taking information from the field, using that information, uh, and, and creating value for customers. So we, we do highly configurable, customizable solutions for various verticals in the industrial space, in the enterprise space. So. Um, we actually started uh, changing the name, uh, the, the, the IoT to IOE, not the same as Cisco, but we started calling us as the Internet of Enterprise Things. Uh, that's what we deal with. Um, I, I, I would say that um, it is not a hype, uh, and I, I, I would like to uh, listen to our other panelists here, what they think about it. And one of the reasons, a couple of things. One is, um, so Cisco just uh, recently established a sort of an, uh, an IoT index, an, an economics index for IoT. Uh, and they came up with an estimate that about 600 billion worth of value um, that IoT alone has already created. Uh, and that's supposed to go to about 1.4 trillion in the next 10 years. So from an economic side, it is delivering value today. So that's to me the first test for um, whether it's a hype or not. And, and the other thing is, what's also happening is um, the democratization of devices. Uh, what I mean by that is it's very easy to put together uh, a sensor device today um, using 
off-the-shelf components connected very cheaply into a back office, a back-end system in the cloud and use very cheap computing resources to do analytics on it. So, so all of the things that you need to put together a solution is sort of making it very, very easy for people to build IoT. So from those two angles, I, I think it's beyond the hype phase. Um, <clears throat> um, it's, it's functioning. So um, it is not fair somehow to um, compete with my uh, co-panelists because uh, I, my experience in uh, Internet of Things is uh, quite low. Um, I just have to say what I believe uh, like a simple uh, IoT user and uh, um, IoT enthusiast. Um, IoT was uh, with us, uh, I mean, uh, since um, forever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about communication, it's about uh, transferring information, it's about um, uh, knowing. Even uh, uh, in uh, uh, some uh, you know, ancient times, uh, in terms of IT, of course, uh, we used radio communication and devices communicated by radio. So IoT is not uh, new. Uh, actually, um, IoT will not remain like this because uh, when uh, web came, uh, we invented web 2.0. Web so we believe Internet of Things, it's about communicating over Internet. I, would, uh, I think in the future we will communicate not on Internet. So uh, I'm, uh, I guess Isabel announced me, so I'll, I'll uh, forgo talking too much about WS2. You should all know about that, I guess. Um, so my experience is that uh, if you're talking about the industrial Internet of Things, I think, uh, you know, Prakash and Gabrielle have absolutely uh, hit it that, you know, there's no question. This has already been happening. It, it, we're actually just relabeling something that's already a big movement that's going on and is undoubtedly going to grow and be huge. Um, it just makes sense to instrument uh, all of our businesses and to just from, for efficiency and all those things. I don't doubt for a second that, the, and that's all happening. There's numerous players, lots of money. And the consumer side is probably where this hype question becomes more uh, of a question because, I mean, we're talking about watches and things, and we're not even sure if those are taking off. I personally, I, I relate this experience of how uh, I did my whole house in 1986 uh, in uh, you know, completely automated. Every switch, every light, every even the even the heating system, everything. I had my house completely automated. I could dial in via you know a 9600 baud modem and go in and switch lights and do all kinds of fun things. But I never actually did my next house and my next house. I never actually did it again. It was uh, it was fun, but not that fun. <laughs> And so I wonder, uh, you know, Nest and all these things, are really everybody going to buy all these things? Are consumers, do they have any compelling need for a lot of this stuff? I don't know. But what gives me hope uh, is that uh, there is such an incredible innovation uh, that's going on. In the, if you look around and you see all the Kickstarter projects, all the different activities happening, uh, there is an incredible movement uh, by hobbyists and other people to build things. And as Prakash mentioned, almost anybody can build anything. I had a, a friend in France who, who did his lawnmower, uh, made it an IoT device, you know, went in and, and hacked it, his lawnmower, <laughs> so he could track it and do things, control it. It's, it's, uh, it's an exciting thing, and it's really gotten, there's no doubt about it, it's gotten an incredible uh, interest from, uh, from people. I think it's, it's 10 times the movement we saw in the Apple iPhone when they and, you know, bought up the apps and 600,000 apps were created in two years, I think we're going to see an amazing amount of innovation and that's going to eventually drive some really big adoption in the consumer side. Very good. So would you, um, so as you're leaving aside maybe the, the consumer side of things, but we're looking at the business side of things. Why, what do you see, what is the business opportunity for people in this room uh, around IoT? Maybe uh, Prakash, you can explain a bit what, what you're doing in, in, in Trimble around in, in, uh, So, yeah, I'll take a, a, a Trimble um, uh, side of it. Um, so, as I said, we have been in the industrial space. Um, the, if you look at the Trimble business, um, we have um, focused on four major sectors, uh, agriculture, construction, um, geospatial, and uh, transportation logistics. So each of them, if you look at it, um, 
So this is why I kind of um, talk about IoT as the IoT is not just this one thing. The, the thing itself has um, different flavors. Um, it has, so there are some things, some sensors that are very simple, um, some that are extremely complex, some can only just do one, one functions, um, uh, some that are completely disconnected um, uh, from, from any kind of power source, which means you got to worry about how you use the battery power in that. Um, so our solutions range from completely automating um, an, an, an agri a precision agriculture business. So um, we started this um, almost 10 or 15 years ago, much before Google invented the uh, auto drive uh, uh, car. Uh, we actually took a steering wheel out of a tractor, put our auto drive, loaded up the, um, the dimensions of a farm, and the tractor would just go and till the whole farm automatically. Um, we can, we can actually, at a millimeter precision level, point out exactly where to plant a seed. Uh, so there are GPS um, sensors in the booms, um, and, and those booms actually automatically control how you plant and where you plant the seeds. Um, we have um, irrigation nozzle that you can control at the nozzle level. These are, again, sensors that are connected, um, and, and, and apply just the right amount of water for the farm. Uh, so that's on the farming side. So we have a whole connected farm initiative where sensors connect the equipment, the, uh, the, the, um, the data feed that goes into the farm so the agronomists get that data and the input that comes from the agronomist uh, and completely connect the whole cycle. Uh, we have a similar thing in, in uh, um, uh, construction. Uh, so we uh, supply... Um, machine controls, tools, software, the construction industry, both in the um, horizontal construction and vertical construction, which means roads, tunnels, and buildings. Uh, a good example that I give, and, and this is another thing that I want to talk about in the IoT space, is I think where I see the difference is what IoT um, advancement is bringing about is transforming the business processes. Processes that did not exist and you couldn't do before you are able to you, you do that now because of the sensors and, and the communication capabilities. So that would be true in very much in utilities uh, sector, I think, as well, right? Indeed, yes. Um, actually, uh, coming back to the question about business opportunities, I think uh, uh, me as an IT guy, actually, I can tell to any business uh, consultant who is coming to me, I can do this. This is the, 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 the difference between, between um, uh, IoT and not, not, uh, non-IoT. Uh, right now we are forced to say to our business customers and business consultants and uh, the entire world, we can do. And we can do it on a, a relatively good budget. This is the difference. The sky is the limit in terms of business opportunities, not only agriculture, not uh, automotive. Uh, actually, the sky is the limit and on a, a fair budget. John, can you give us some examples? You're talking to a lot of our prospects around IoT and platform today. What, what do you see? Other than Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> Other than Tesla. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we have uh, uh, customers who do lighting systems that uh, are you know, improving the uh, efficiency of the lighting systems uh, tremendously. There's, uh, I think energy management in general is just a huge area. Uh, health is an area that uh, also is explosive. Uh, and, you know, that verges between the industrial and the, and the consumer because uh, it obviously has to do with consumers, but uh, the data and the devices are going to enable a transformation, I think, in the health industry. Um, you know, there, virtually every industry is... Uh, is ripe for a lot of innovation uh, in this area. It's it's just staggering. There's a uh, there's a chart that uh, Beecham does that shows like all the industries that are affected, uh, and it just from farming to you know almost any industry can be more automated, more efficient by collecting data. And the, and the big thing that's happened is the as as people know, I guess the the cost of the sensors and the computers dropped so much, and and the ability to be connected. Uh, has enabled us to just connect everything. That's the in basic innovation that's going on here. And uh, once you have all this stuff and you're able to collect data, uh, I just uh, think there's opportunities in almost every business area we look at. And we talk to customers all the time who are looking at, uh, at that. 
Fantastic. So, so the next step for that, so I'm convinced uh, I want to, you know, do some innovation around IoT in my business. What do I need? What, what does an IoT platform look like and which characteristics must it have? So, so again, um, the, 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 I talked about what we do at Trumbull and, and I talked about, you know, um, you collect data from the sensors and you, you process it and, and, and so you might think, so what's a big deal? So for us, the big deal is about um, business transformation. It's the, the secret sauce that we add is the domain expert, expertise. So um, how do we actually tra make it make what exists today? It, you know, it has gone through already the automation phase and optimization phase. How do you transform it? Transform it to something completely new. Um, so what we try to do is we focus on that area, and then everything else try to pick up from everywhere we can get. Uh, for example, our entire um, um, platform that that basically receives the data, processes the data, um, it, most of it we built it uh, on top of WSO2. Uh, so we built our own uh, pass layer and we built that uh, in, 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 in using WSO2. Um, the, we're trying to do the same on the sensor level. We do make some sensors, some that are very specific to the areas we deal with. But what I always talk about, uh, my dream is the day when Somebody can build a sensor that affects um, uh, our customer's business. They could just go and buy it. They could plug it in and it automatically connects to our um, cloud services and automatically start delivering um, a value for the customer. Um, think about this like a bulb, you know. You never think about when you go to buy a bulb um, to say, okay, which energy company am I going to get power from? Should I buy a specific type of bulb? No. Um, and the energy company doesn't care about where you buy the bulb from, right? All they worry about is once you put it in, they have to supply electricity to that, they have to mirror that, they have to bill you. And, and that's the way I see the uh, IoT innovation effect. It's one of the requirements. So integration, would you see? Yes. So I heard about this morning, there was another panel about analytics and predictive analytics and machine learning and how this, you know, with the massive amount of data that you have to move, Right. How are, you know, the analytics are going to be so important in that world? So, so that's where, again, that, you know, it, it, people always talk about, so we need to do machine learning, we should analyze all this data. And, and, but what most people uh, struggle with is, so what's the value that I'm trying to derive? That value has to relate to the domain. Unless you know the aerospace industries, you cannot walk in and say, I'm going to collect all the data coming from uh, Boeing 707, I'm trying to give you value, right? So it's exactly the same thing. You need to know the problem to kind of really do the analytics. Yes, for me, uh, the perfect IoT device is the one which is uh, so intelligent that it could decide for himself, not, not uh, functioning in a master-slave way, because I do not uh, want to use the client-server way, but the master-slave way in you know, IoT uh, architecture. So from my point of view, when we will um, invent an intelligent sensor who will decide for himself, for example, to turn on and actuate the over a uh, secure protocol, but not HTTP or M uh, MQTT, or uh, which he, I mean, uh, coming back to what Paul said, I think uh, we don't have to resolve the security problem at the level of communicating uh, be between master and slave. We should resolve all in the protocol. We should leave IoT devices to do what they do better, to measure, um, I don't know, calculate, do something like that. Not try to in introduce some security stuff inside of them or try to authenticate themselves to, to change, purely change the protocol. The protocol should contain a uh, unique ID to ID communication master to slave. So this is my opinion. I, I, I'm not an IoT expert, so it's, it's just a visionary uh, idea. In, in your, but in your coming back to utility sector, because uh, here uh, I really am an expert. Uh, 10 years actually, not 15, uh, 10 years of uh, matter to cash process. Uh, we were trying to do something like um, smart uh, matter, which is someone uh, also uh, told us uh, previously, but so smart to build himself. Because uh, if you don't know an SAP system, which is the biggest ERP in, in the world, uh, 100,000 customers built takes about six hours. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, three years ago, at the SAP Utilities Company, SAP uh, 
requested for a smart matter solution who will be able to build themselves. That's uh, actually the future from my point of view in terms of uh, IoT and uh, metro reading. Yeah, so we were discussing this as well as like there's a lot of need for doing things at the edge basically, right? Starting doing calculations, even aggregation, even billing as you're saying on, on the sensor itself rather than pushing all that to a server. Uh, John, you're, yeah. you're the EDA. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you're, you have written a lot about this idea and yeah. IoT. Can you enlighten us on this? So one of the great things is uh, I invented public subscribers, I uh, you mentioned before, and, and uh, all of the protocols, all of the IoT devices are built around uh, publish subscribe. Really is uh, amazing. So, and the reason actually though is, is quite rational. And uh, I wrote a blog about this uh, just a few weeks ago at, at how uh, there's really a, uh, uh, it's surprising how much a trading floor is like uh, your, ho your home in terms of IoT requirements. So, you know, the, the publish subscribe paradigm and the idea that everything can know about uh, everything else gets to some of the points you guys are bringing up about locality. You want uh, the devices locally to be able to talk to each other so that you can do uh, things without depending on the mothership, as, you know, Paul mentioned it. And unfortunately, a lot of the devices out there today are uh, still trying to just basically talk to the mothership. But, uh, you know, we, we need to get to a new architecture that everybody agrees upon. And there's the standards groups that are, that are out there trying to do that. And I don't, that we're still years behind. I don't know how long it's going to take them to get those standards. Uh, and then all the devices, you know, consistent with it. But in any case, no matter how you look at it, there is a communications layer. And there's a whole bunch of competing standards right now. And on top of that, and there's, you need various adapters and protocols. But then on top of that, you need to be able to collect and orchestrate and operate on devices locally, which means you need uh, things like a, a mediation bus, the ESB, or a rules engine or some other uh, orchestration tools. And then you need to be able to process that data to some extent and then deliver it to the cloud at some point because everybody still wants access to their devices, whether you're a corporation or a person. And so you need to have access to the, some of the information in the cloud. So, you know, it might be just emergency data. If it's a building, you might just want uh, the corporation to know about the building's health. Uh, they don't need to know every bit of data that came in from every sensor uh, in the building, right? They probably only are caring about the, the... So you need something to decide what gets published up to the higher levels of the infrastructure, and you need a, a capability to do all that. Uh, and then in the upper layers, you need to be able to collect that data and operate and do business process on it. And it's at every point, you need to be able to collect data and process it for analytics, the, the uh, research. But, uh, you know, basically you need to be able to do all the data analytics that we see. So you need all the tools that uh, WSO2 has in terms of the data uh, analysis, streaming, BAM, and CEP engine for events. It turns out all this messaging infrastructure is reusable in a published subscribe paradigm for IoT. So, um, you know, it's a great, it's a great combination. Uh, of technologies that we have that just happen to fit. Uh, but there's a lot of things you need. Device management is another yeah. uh, a thing I'll just point out really yeah. quickly. We need to have a device management. We have device management capability, uh, app management. You need to have all those layers uh, as well in your architecture. So uh, as, a, as a comment, I don't know if you, you guys have read this, but uh, Paul, about a year ago, uh, together with some people in our team, just created a, a reference architecture white paper for IoT, which I will really encourage all of you to read, so you can see how that, that those building blocks that John is talking about are actually fitting together, right? The integration, the even subscription, the analytics part, the device management part, the security, to the point of what Paul was making earlier. So it is time for taking questions and comments for a fine audience here. So who has, uh, can I just borrow one of your, I think we have all the microphones here. Do you guys have an extra one? Okay, fantastic, thank you. Do we have any questions or comments for the panel? You should have some comments. You've done that, right? Smart metering, you've been talking about it. Do you have any comments or? You were talking about uh, that a lot of the capabilities that we have now centrally that they should move into the edge. 
And, uh, can you comment a bit about uh, the challenges that we will face there when we try to squeeze a complex event processor into well, a light bulb? Well, I wasn't saying put it in the edge in terms of a, a complex event processor in the light bulb, but um, uh, so most of the architectures have a hub or some kind of uh, other uh, aggregation point where data is collected locally from uh, us, a whole mesh of IoT devices. Yeah. But on the other hand, we do expect the IoT devices to be able to communicate with each other and, and share information where they need. So they may not uh, be doing CEP, but they might you know, use temperature data to decide when to do some switch on or off. And you might, you might uh, set that kind of relationship up. And the great thing about doing it at the edge like that, where you can put maybe simple uh, things like that, is that it's autonomous, right? And so even if the hub breaks down or if the cloud breaks down, if the devices can talk to each other, you have uh, the ability for the system to function. And that's a critical thing that um, I think a lot of people are missing in the IoT world is if your light switch doesn't work because it needs to talk to the internet and talk to someplace in, you know, in the cloud, uh, that's really a bummer. <laughs> Make much, it's not much of an improvement in the world if you have There's a question there, um, from this gentleman, all the way. She'll, she'll be with you in a second. <laughs> Hi, and thanks for this uh, interesting debate. So my question is linked more, it's more a reflection, an open question, let me say, because, for example, if we take the smart home market, 10 or 20 years before, everybody predicted that all the homes will be smart, but we are in 2015 and we are so far from this reality. You don't think that the IoT will be the same? Comes back to the first question, I guess. So, so again, I didn't understand that. So the, the question is, will IoT be the same in, in 50 years? What you yeah, asked? because we, we predict, everybody said 20 billion, 50 billion by 2020. We are almost 2016. And probably this promise will not be, uh, how I say, uh, done or forecast. Yeah. So again, uh, this is why I kind of have a slightly different view on what IoT is because uh, even that earlier discussion about um, what is done in the edge, what is done in the, you know, what as Cisco calls it in the fog or in the network, or what is done in the back. And again, the, the answer to all of that, it, it depends, right? And, and phone is just an incredible um, collection of sensors, right? The first smartphone came up, there was like one sensor, and now there's uh, a, a whole array of sensors in every smartphone. So, um, and I'll give you a really a real life example. In, the, in our transportation logistics business, when you, when you want to kind of really monitor if a vehicle actually is passing through a really dangerous zone, let's say, and, and the way you do that is you mark a geofence around it and then um, you trigger an alert as it enters and exits that to make sure that um, you know, it, it has gone through that or, or to avoid that it's, it's going through that. Um, many times if you rely on a sensor that just sends the data back and the, uh, the analytics and the decision making or the complex event processing has to be done in the back end, you may have passed through that geofence so fast that you would not even detect it, right? So in that case, you have to actually do the processing in the edge. So there is definite scenarios where the processing has to be done in the edge, and that's where you look at to say, okay, what's my scenario? I have a, um, a platform, which is the vehicle itself, uh, which provides um, sort of continuous power. So now I can put a much better processor in there, much more complex um, collection of sensors there that can take the GPS location, do the computing, and actually do the, the derived alert or, or event um, rather than just sending the raw data back and the, the back, back end system do that. So in, in all of this, whether you have 50 million or 50 billion phones um, or, or a trillion phones in 10 years, 15 years, um, that phone alone is not going to do all of it. You know, there's going to be all kinds of sensors. And, and that's the most exciting part to me is um, that, that the, the, the array of sensors with the different capabilities are going to kind of really enhance and, and help us invent workflows that don't even exist in the enterprise today. Well, I, I think I brought up some of your points earlier that, uh, you know, there's a question whether in 
as far as the home market, I'm not at all questioning in the business. I think that this issue's done. It's already they already have been doing this in the businesses. It's actually what's going to happen. I think is because of the cost reductions and everything, we're going to see uh, IoT spreading to the small and the medi medium sized businesses much faster and, and in a much more robust way. But also then. Even in the big corporations, we're seeing a massive expansion of because we can now do a lot more and infer more data, get more automation, more intelligence. In the home market, it's a completely different question. So in the home market, uh, my opinion is that uh, you know, it's yet to be proved what the, what the value is to the customer. But um, you know, Apple wants to make the, the phone the center of the world, of course, because they sell you the phone. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if that's it. There's the hub model. There, there's a number of ways in which the, the technology, but the, the basic idea is, you know, if we can get a value in the home, if there's innovators who come up with some things that, uh, you know, in for our personal life, uh, I think medical, there's a bunch of reasons why it'll definitely happen in some of these spaces. But uh, I think in the home still is a question how fast that will happen. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about, are about the combination of IoT uh, within the context of context-aware applications or business <coughs> applications. Your my my understanding of context-aware applications uh, and the relationship to IoT. No. Yeah. So, um, well, the most the thing that sticks in my mind is uh, the most is around the medical area, right? Because uh, you get devices uh, that have a lot of contextual understanding of, of uh, you know, capacitance of the skin, uh, heat flux, and things like this, but there's also diabetes monitors and stuff. You need, the, you need those IoT devices to be uh, very smart and intelligent about the local environment they're in and the, and the particular thing that they're doing, right? And then, uh, so I'm not sure exactly where to, where to go with this, but uh, we're seeing a lot of innovation in all these IoT devices, and they all are becoming more and more context aware so that they're smarter. That's the, the nature. If you look at my Tesla, <laughs> no, no, it's getting no, really smart. No, not yet. Uh, <laughs> if I may just add to that actually quickly, um, I think that's an important one because I think what the sensors are going to do is it's not going to be one sensor providing the entire context. It could be a combination of it actually. So your phone could become part of that context and the sensor itself could become part of the context, right? Um, because let's say you, you're in, I'll take the place that I go most often, Palo Alto during a business meeting, um, and you, are, you happen to be there, there could be a sensor that actually senses um, which restaurant has the best meal um, or has as, as a particular um, you know, uh, promotion going, and your phone could be the sensor that receives that information, and, and, and also you, it, the, the phone really understands the context in which you are, you are in the business context, not in, in your personal and private context. So you probably don't want to go to a pizza store, you want to go to a slightly nicer restaurant. So the, the combination of those two sensors working together creates an application that is much more uh, context aware and much more sort of uh, filtered um, and, and actionable uh, data to you. So I think that's an important yeah, I guess that's really where the, the real business innovation is, right? So I'm not, I'm not supposed to be a panelist, but I'm just going to share uh, <laughs> and uh, it's an information anyways. I've been working uh, uh, with quite some customers in the retail industry, and that's an industry where uh, this is really important to them in terms of digital marketing to be able to give you some promotion, for example, like right there, right now. Um, the, the effect of uh, you're receiving a mail saying there's a promotion on this thing, you're not maybe interested to read the mail. You don't need that thing like right now. But if I'm giving you that exact same ad when you are like in the shop or in a situation where you really need to buy that thing, then it's a complete different user experience, customer experience. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the retail industry around this. There's a lot of stuff happening there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one of the cool applications I saw recently that one of our customers, uh, or potential customers actually, is, is around the lighting. When you go into a supermarket, they can, uh, they can uh, look at the lighting and a code that comes out of the lighting that can be recognized on the phone uh, through, a, through a picture, which then identifies the, the exact location and uh, place that you're at so that uh, it can give you directions around the store. And then using that contextual information as you're walking around the store, it can offer you some promotions, uh, promotions and things. Combination. I think the, the network effect, what I call the network effect, which is the combination of devices, that's what you were talking about, 
uh, you know, Prakash is, is incredibly powerful. We're, we don't even know where that could go, but uh, it, it's enormously uh, valuable to take into context mm -hmm. when you have multiple devices what the solution is. And other information. We, we have time for one last question or comment. There is any? I guess there's somebody there in the back, but I can't see. Ah, this gentleman from the wall. Uh, my question is, is quick. It's about IoT, uh, about Laura and Sigfox, the new mobile network dedicated for the IoT. What do you think about? I, I didn't get that. Question. Laura and uh, La Laura and Sigfox. Uh, Sigfox. Sigfox. These are the uh, beacons, right? The, the beacon technology and the detect the. Yeah, it's uh, the new mobile. Let's say the new yeah. network for IoT. Right. And I, I've just heard about you know even this week really more about the. Uh, that whole uh, initiative, and uh, I don't have a huge com amount of comments myself. Um, it, it sounds like uh, an exciting new innovative approach to how to use these IoT, that you walk around and you, and you uh, devices are all over the place that you connect to that can tell you stuff about uh, things. It's, it's a brilliant idea. So, so we have been experimenting with some of the beacon technologies for indoor navigation, actually. Um, it's not, not, not just to move around in a mall, but even, in the construction site, um, you have to sometimes deploy certain type of workers and certain, so if you're building a 20-story building, uh, you might need the plumbers on the 15th floor, you might need the carpenters on the third floor, um, and, and the beacons actually can, in, and in conjunction with some of the other sensors, can tell you exactly what's the percentage of work done in, in a particular floor, what phase has been completed, and how do I actually schedule workers to go to a specific floor. So um, the beacon technologies in general is something that's of a huge benefit in both in the consumer side as well as in the uh, industrial side. Thank you very much. Our time is up, up, <laughs> about one minute. So thank you very much thank you. To, thank for you your too. question and thank you for you too for attending this session. Thank you.